Joram was an interesting man, but he killed his brothers. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. As we discover the Word of God, we are going to be studying 2 Chronicles chapter 21 in just a moment. But as we do that, let's think about this. What is God saying to us? We'll do so and talk about that in a bit. Corey and Ryan are here. I'm going to be taking a look at some of the politics that were going on in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. Ryan? Did Solomon have 40,000 stalls for chariots and horses, or did he only have 4,000? This is the question that I'm going to try to answer on today's program. Very interesting as we look at Solomon and his uh, reign as a king. Very fascinating. Janice. Today it's our Friday wrap up question. I'm going to look anywhere from 1 Chronicles 22 through to 2 Chronicles chapter 24. All right, very good. Let's open up your Bible guide and understand what God is saying to us. If you don't have one, stay tuned. We'll tell you how you can get one. Second Chronicles 21, 1 through 7. And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariah Hugh, Michael, and Shephatiah. All these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah, but he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the princes of Israel. Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done, for he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David, and since he had promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. Second Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 through seven. You know, generational choices are really, really important. And as we focus here on 2 Chronicles chapter 21, this gets very interesting. The Lord uh, speaks through this chapter and it's very, very fascinating to understand what he's saying. Uh, for example, every generation must make a decision about who Jesus Christ is. None of us can ride the coattails of our parents or our grandparents' decisions when it comes to faith. Now, King Jehoram in our teaching today, in our reading today, is a prime example of this. Though his father was a king who regarded the ways of God and respected God's law, Jehoram did not. He was married also, and that didn't help him as well, because he made a marriage with an alliance of the Israel Omerite dynasty by marrying the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Now, together, this couple forsook God. They got rid of God. And it strikes me that the devil can so easily manipulate us. You see, we are always tempted to think that we're smart that we're advanced. We're beyond needing God who tells us to suppress our natural urges. And we can use those natural urges and explore them. Well, this lie leaves us lost, leaves us out of control and at war. Sin has to be dealt with. And I thank God that I live on this side of the cross in which Jesus Christ has given his life. We killed him. He allowed that to happen. And he ended up dying for three days. He gave his life. And then at the end of the three days, he rose from the dead. And that brought him to a very interesting place. Because when he rose from the dead, he was fully flesh, fully God, as he was before. And now his flesh is in heaven at the right hand of God. Isn't that something? 
Well, take your Bible guide and turn to today's passages as we look at this. Second Chronicles chapter 21 is very interesting. And if you don't have a Bible guide, I want to encourage you to write or call or go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. When you go there, click on the Bible guide. It'll take you to a donate page. And may I say thank you for your donations. The donations are very important to us and they help us and they keep us alive. And uh, we literally exist on the offerings of people who give just like you. So thank you for that. We don't talk about the amount. The Holy Spirit will reveal that to you. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name, you would reveal it to the people. And uh, in Jesus' name, amen. And then it takes you to a place where you can download the guide exactly how we've printed it. Very, very interesting. All right, that's really good for overseas too, by the way. And I want to encourage our overseas viewers watching on the Inspirational Network and on Faith TV and some other places. Anyway, let's pray before we read. Father, help us today. We need to read your word and listen to it and help us to understand in Jesus name. Amen. The 21st chapter of Second Chronicles says, and Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. He rested with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. And he had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azarahu, Michael, and Shepatiah. All of these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, kings of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah. But he gave the kingdom, his kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now listen carefully. Jehoshaphat had other sons, but he gave Jehoram the kingdom. It is important to teach those who will come after us about the Lord Jesus Christ and his ways. We need to keep that in mind because we have to assume that God's going to tarry. And if he does, we've got to make the next generation ready. And we've seen what happens when we slide away from knowing God. We slide away from doing God's will. So, beloved, we need to train people by showing them. And the best way to train is to show them and to live the example of Jesus Christ and to handle the difficulties that life throws us. And there will be many. But we navigate through that with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, people will ask, how did you do that? We'll say one answer through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, let's read on because this gets interesting. Jehoram was 30. uh, He was 32 years old when he became king. Now, Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father. And he strengthened himself and killed. He killed his brothers with the sword and also other princes of Israel. We remember that Jehoram killed his brothers and leaders of Israel to strengthen himself. He didn't, he wasn't assigned by his father to do that. Beloved, we should remember that we should not look or depend our, on ourselves to gain the strength, but only to the Lord. Do you understand what we're saying? We're saying that our strength to go into the next generation, to successfully live through the next generation, deal with the difficulties, deal with the problems which will come our way. It doesn't come from us. We have to seek God and we have to say, Lord, we need your help to go forward. Now, Jehoram, unfortunately, didn't do that. That becomes a problem. He killed his brothers. And you know what? His father said to his sons, go forward in peace and rule my kingdom. But he didn't do that. Isn't that something? Beloved, we need to pay attention to the word of God because it tells us the truth about how to live. Now, let's read on because this gets interesting. And Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king and he reigned. This is important. He reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. Very important to hear that. Just as the house of Ahab had done, he was, he was totally ignored God. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now listen. Yet the Lord would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that God made with David and sincere, or and since he promised to give a lamp to him 
and also to his sons forever. This is important to remember. You see, God kept his covenant with the house of David steady because of who he was, not because of the kings. You see, beloved, let's remember that the Lord always honors his word. Now, with that in mind, we need to pay attention to this because God honors his word. But there comes a point when we ignore God and say, we're done with you, God. We don't want any more to do with you. We'll live how we want to live. When that happens, God begins to understand that we are rejecting him. And what he does is back off. And when he backs off, do you know who moves in? Satan. He is a real live entity. He is a fallen angel. He is a nasty person and he wants to kill every human being. He wants to destroy. He's a spiritual person, wants to destroy everybody. And he moves in and he finagles us up. We fight wars. We kill each other. We his, his whole thing is about killing and destroying. That's really important. So beloved, today let's remember that we need to turn our ways away from evil and turn our ways towards Jesus Christ. The best way to do that is to pray and say, Lord Jesus, we need you in our hearts. Now, today, we repent. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ today that we would not be sidetracked by our own ideas, but we would be directed by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come into our hearts, come into our life today, and teach us your way and show us your path as we look at Zechariah and learn about the future. Help us to hear what you're saying in the name of Jesus Christ. And we said together, amen and amen. All right, so my segment today is all about 2 Chronicles chapter 9, which seems to contradict 1 Kings chapter 4. And here's the problem. In 1 Chronicles 9.25, it says that Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his horses. But back in 1 Kings 4.26, it says that Solomon had 40,000 stalls. So 1 Kings gives a figure 10 times that of 1 Chronicles. And this is one of the supposed errors in the Bible that skeptics use to discredit the scriptures as the word of God. But is this truly a mistake? Well, let's study these passages in close detail. Although the Bible claims to be the supernatural revelation of God, unbelievers claim that it is nothing more than a human production full of errors and contradictions. One example they point to is 1 Kings 4.26, which records that Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. But in the parallel passage of 2 Chronicles 9.25, it says that Solomon had only 4,000 stalls for his horses and chariots. While skeptics would have us believe that this is a nail in the coffin of Christianity, let's just hold our horses here. There is a solution. As a matter of fact, there are at least two possible explanations to this conundrum. However, the most likely explanation is that there is a copyist mistake in one of these passages. And it's probably in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26, which records the higher figure of 40,000 stalls which seems pretty large based on the number of horses that Solomon had. Both passages seem to indicate that Solomon had 12,000 horses. If so, 4,000 stalls would be room enough because the normal complement for a chariot was three horses, two primary and one reserve. So if Solomon had 12,000 horses and three horses were assigned to each stall, that equals 4,000 stalls. Another reason scholars believe that the 40,000 stalls is a copyist error is because while most Hebrew manuscripts place this number at 40,000, there is a Greek Septuagint manuscript and one Hebrew manuscript that say 4,000, which is also the number indicated in 2 Chronicles 9.25. In reality, many of the supposed errors and inconsistencies in the Bible that unbelievers point to are really just minor scribal slips like these. Remember, the Bible as we have it now is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy and so on of the original. And copying mistakes are inevitable since it is beyond the capability of anyone to avoid any and every slip of the pen in copying page after page from any book, whether that's sacred or secular. But just as with other books, an error in the copy of it isn't the same as an error in the original. So these copying mistakes do not undermine the perfection of the original biblical autographs. 
But does this call into question the reliability of the Bibles that we hold in our hand today? Not at all. Why? Because we have thousands of ancient biblical manuscripts to compare our modern copies to, and they reveal that all the scribal slips are minor, mostly involving numbers and names, and do not alter any biblical doctrine whatsoever. So as you can see, there is a simple solution to this so-called faith-breaking conundrum. And I'm not going to go through it all again, but I do want to say that while it is important to defend the faith through apologetics, it's also important not to miss the point of the passage. I mean, why are we told the number of Solomon's stables anyway? Well, it wasn't just to demonstrate how wealthy he was. The main reason that we're told the number of stables and horses Solomon had is to show that he had violated God's command in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 16, that Israelite kings were not to multiply horses. But according to Kings and Chronicles, Solomon had 12,000 horses and 1,400 chariots. And by way of comparison, an Assyrian account of the Battle of Karkar in 853 BC, which was about a century after Solomon, speaks of 1,200 chariots from Damascus, 700 chariots from Hamath, and 2,000 chariots from Israel's northern kingdom. Now, horses, of course, were animals of war, so it seems that Solomon was trusting in his own might rather than God's, and that was a mistake on Solomon's part. Now, if you want to watch a longer version of this video that goes into a lot more detail, then I have posted it to my YouTube channel. So make sure to check it out if you can. What's interesting about this is the comparison that uh, Israel had at that time had a lot of um, military and it was powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, that's, that's stunning. And that's that's yeah. really something. And so, uh, you know, it's very different today, but it's just fascinating. Uh, so thank you, Ryan, very for much sure. for that. I just want to briefly mention before we go to Corey that uh, I put together a sermon series from Zechariah, the first six chapters of Zechariah. It's very interesting. And uh, it's called, well, essentially, it's about the end times. And I put it together just for you for people who are watching on television so and watching on the internet and all that. So if you would like those, it's $30 for those. You can go to our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com and you can order there or you can call us or write to us and ask for that sermon set on Zechariah. It's very, very interesting. So thank you very much, Janice, or rather Corey. <laughs> yes. I, so I wanted to talk about something that uh, were, you were assigned to read in the Bible Guide if you're reading through the entire Bible with us this year. Uh, but as always on the program, we just choose a portion, uh, at least you do, Dad, you choose a portion of that reading uh, to focus in on. So I wanted to focus in on a slightly different section. And that section is, of course, um, I want to look at Joash, this boy king who starts out his reign really well, but then it goes south really quickly and he kind of does this complete 180 turn to idolatry um, after the high priest Jehoiada dies. And a lot of times this is difficult for us to, to, to kind of wrap our minds around it. It just seems like it kind of comes out of nowhere. But if you're paying close attention to the text, you can actually see that there's a lot of human politics going on here. And there's a power play between two men and between two families, the family of Jehoiada, the high priest, and the family of the kings of Judah. Uh, and, and I think the Bible is pretty clear on that. So I just, I, I wanted to, to point your attention out to it in case you are reading along with us and have read uh, 2 Chronicles 20 to 24. So the story of Joash is very, very sad. Uh, his, his grandmother, Athaliah, who was the daughter of Ahab, and Jezebel, she had married in to the line of David, these royal kings of Judah and Jerusalem. And when her son dies in battle, she kills all, all of the uh, boys who would have been able to take the throne uh, of Jerusalem. And she reigns herself, except there is a princess who she, so she's of the line of David. Uh, she was Ahaziah's sister. Um, she is actually married to the high priest, Jehoiada, and so she has access to the temple, which is very interesting, but she also has access to the royal palace of Jerusalem, and she's able to save Joash, a baby, a baby son of the dead king. And she brings him to live with herself and Jehoiada, the high priest, and they raise him in secret for seven years in the temple. And then, of course, they launch, they stage this overthrow of Athaliah and they claim Joash as king. And this all happens in Second Chronicles chapter 23. So 
What's really interesting here, though, is we've got this figure of Jehoiada, the high priest. He is the high priest of Israel, but he is also married to the king's daughter, meaning that technically he has a claim, if he wanted to, he has a claim to the Jerusalem throne, the throne of Jerusalem. And we see him exercising that claim, if not in word, in deed, because uh, he essentially becomes a co-regent for Joash, meaning he's Jehoiada the high priest is making all the decisions because Joash is only seven. Uh, and, and we see this in the account, you know, right away. Um, uh, when Joash becomes king, when he's seven, it says in Second Chronicles 23, verse 16, and Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people that um, and the king that they should be the Lord's people. So we see Jehoiada exercising priestly and kingly authority in Jerusalem. Um, and we're told later on that Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. But then it goes into this story where Joash, when he gets a little bit older, he's a teenager and he's got a little bit of independence now. It says, Joash decided, Joash decided to restore the house of the Lord. So he gathers all the priests and he tells them what to do, go collect the taxes, but they don't do it. And so it, it says in verse five and six, but the Levites did not act quickly. So the king summoned Jehoiada, the chief, and said to him, why have you not required the Levites? So do you see what's going on here? The Levites were like, yeah, yeah, okay, Joash. But because Jehoiada didn't give the command, they decided to listen to Jehoiada, who has this kingly priestly role instead of the actual king. And so Joash summons Jehoiada, gives him a talking up and down, and then Jehoiada does it. So already we see this tension existing between Joash and Jehoiada. So when Jehoiada dies, he is buried with the kings in the city of David. He's buried, he's given the king's burial, which is another hint. Now, then we're told after the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king and the king listened to them. So they're giving him some bad advice, probably stirring up that, that tension between the house of Jehoiada and the house of Joash now. Uh, Jehoiada, uh, you know, arranged marriages for Joash. So now he has his own kids, but Jehoiada had his own kids. And we're told that God, the spirit of God clothed the son of Jehoiada, who's now dead. Zechariah, and he prophesies against Joash because Joash is turning the nation into idolatry. And Joash has him killed because Zechariah not only offended him, but Zechariah has a massive claim to the throne. Not only is he, he has a direct blood connection to Joash through his mother, but his father was the priest king of Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, Joash has to pay for that. But I think, I think what we, what we see is this really sad court intrigue that goes on, but that, that could have been avoided and probably would have been because there's no indication that Zechariah was trying to be king. He was just trying to, he was the high priest. He was trying to follow God. You know, God was empowering him. Uh, so there's no indication that he was trying to take over the throne. Maybe he was. Um, but we see this really sad political situation come out of tension, human intrigue, and human politics. Rather than trusting in God, they were infighting with each other. Now, the story gets a little bit better with Joash's son, Amaziah, uh, in part, potentially, because of the marriage that righteous Jehoiada the high priest had arranged for Joash uh, because the, the queen mothers uh, exercised a decent amount of authority and influence in, in, the, in the court. And it seems that she was pretty solid and, and, and helped Amaziah go. It's the right really, way. really Isn't interesting. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, really when you is. get into the human element of yeah. it, you're like, okay, this kind of makes sense why Joash went, was really good. And then he went completely the opposite way because he's like, oh, you're going to control me, are you? And that's oh, the you're typical. Gonna take, you're going to yeah. take my power, yeah. are you? Exactly. Makes a lot of sense. That's, that's, it does make a lot of sense. That's and what we wrestle with today. So yeah. easy to just read over yeah. and not ponder on those things. Yeah. And that's why I love both your segments and Ryan's as well, because it gives it <laughs> Minute 44, good you're, you're good to go. Oh, we've got lots of time <laughs> for sure. All right. So thank you very yeah. much. And Excellent, you, Corey. Uh, Ryan, that's great. And I look forward to your sermons on Zachariah. That's great. 
Okay, so our Friday wrap-up question of the week is this: Where did Solomon begin to build the temple? And here's a geographical hint: at Jerusalem. Where did Solomon begin to build the temple at Jerusalem? Was it on Mount Moriah? Was it on Mount Sinai? Or was it on Mount Gerizim? Mount Moriah, Mount Sinai, or Mount Gerizim? Probably. The What do you think? I'm not going to say anything. That's right. <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> I saw your hands start to move, and then I saw you very good by folding them. Good job. But, All right. But thank you. So now I'm yeah. going to turn over here. What do you think? Do you have an answer for this one? Yes, we are quite confident. Are you? And、we、you、are. at home? Are you ready with your answer? I'm going to get them to reveal it in just a moment. Okay, where did Solomon begin to build the temple at Jerusalem? Was it on Mount Moriah? Was it on Mount Sinai? Or was it on Mount Gerizim? What mount? It, it was on Mount Moriah. On yeah, Mount yeah, Moriah. Mount Moriah. All right. Well, <laughs> if you answered Mount Moriah, listen to the answer in Second Chronicles chapter three, verse one. Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. That's right. That's Probably、right. where Abraham was sacrificing his son Isaac, which he didn't do. I want to thank you for supporting this ministry. We don't say it much, but it really means a lot to us. That keeps us alive. So I know it's a difficult time, but the Lord speaks. And Father, I pray that you would speak to people and help them, and steady us, Lord, as we go forward. You said you would take care of our needs. Help us, Lord, as we move forward. We're going to continue to give to your ministries. So, Father, in Jesus' name, be with the people and touch them today. Amen.